Hello everybody, welcome to another Guitar Night Live from Ultimate School of Music in Dunleary. I'm Daniel Jacobson. Tonight my guest is one of the best guitar players in our country. He's been playing for a long time and he's played with loads of people like Stefan Grappelli and Lee Connitz and way too many to name. Absolutely loads of people. And he's taught a lot of people as well, including myself, he was one of my teachers back from the 90s when I started playing. I used to go to a two hour improv class Tommy used to do. My guest tonight is Tommy Hafferty. I'm really glad to have Tommy here. How are you doing, Tommy? Fine, yeah, I'm yes. <laughs> Under these strange circumstances, yes. <laughs> good, good. So Tommy wanted to start off by asking you, how did you get into playing guitar in the first place? And what age were you when you started playing? Well. Um, I, I was kind of a late starter, actually. Um, I was about 19 years of age, and uh, it was a time when I was, uh, some people saw it in a good light, like my my mother and all that, but in a bad light. I was in a seminary, <laughs> training to be a Jesuit priest, but, <laughs> but we won't go into that tonight. <laughs> oh, <laughs> why? And, <laughs> but there was a very good uh, um, a friend of mine from Dublin in the, uh, the seminary at the time, and he played the guitar and played all the Beatles songs. Um, and, and Pat was his name, and he was a very good uh, soccer player as well. <laughs> he played for Home Farm, which I heard uh, afterwards. It was a very good uh, a team uh, uh, in Dublin. So um, he used to play all these uh, Beatles songs, and then I eventually, going home uh, to Derry one time, I brought the guitar back, and he would show me all these Beatles songs, and uh, it was the interesting thing, I, I, they were all the right chords, and he was totally playing from uh, from, from his ear and all that, so I, I got to learn from there um, just the basic, very basic chords on the guitar, so that was the start, actually. Uh, and then when I, when I left the uh, priesthood later, uh, when I was 24 later, for that, obviously, and that's in the very early 70s, 71, 72. Um, I had an experience, I, can't, I haven't left the priesthood, of course, my mother, as you can imagine, in Derry was very disappointed, very distraught. So I decided to move out for a while and I came to Dublin and I stayed with my sister. And uh, the interesting thing with my sister, she said one night, don't you like guitar? And I said, of course I do, you know. Uh, and she said, well, there's a guy in Dublin and um, but I, he plays in a terrible place in Dublin. But we'll tell you what he plays tomorrow Friday night, and says, "I'll bring you, to, I'll bring you down to hear him." You know, I said, "Great," you know, and all that. And uh, it was down in the Keys, down in the docks. It was called Rogers and Keys. It was Kelly's. It's called Kelly's, right? Because I always remember it was such an experience I was going to have. So I remember all the details. And uh, anyway, and, and they were full of dockers, and, uh, and she, of course, my sister walks in, and of course, all the heads turn around and say, "Good, wow, what's what a what a pleasure we got tonight," you know, and she. <laughs> And then I come in after her, like a, a little lamb behind her, like we'll go. But uh, the music was playing, and, um, and absolutely, and, and, and a revelation in terms of just what they were playing. Uh, uh, Louis was playing uh, Take the Last Train to Clarksville, you know, and I always remember it was like. <laughs> It was just a song by the monkeys that I knew all the words and, and typically probably learned it in the seminary as well. And so I thought, great, oh, this is all this is all what I need, you know. And he improvised and you know it was amazing. And that was Louis Stewart. And, and uh, had you like not heard like, you hadn't heard much jazz before that? I, I, I there was some jazz in my house. and uh, my brother used to have Duke Ellington, but I was still listening to uh, the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix and the Hollies, you know. Yeah. That would be the day because I loved that they were playing all and I really loved yeah that so this uh, re revelation of this guitar player playing the the monkeys you know so my how, sister, yeah how did it come that you had you had lessons then with Louis yeah Stewart. I did I said uh, she said to me go up and ask him for lessons you know and then of course I said yeah great you know like I eventually plucked up. I mustered up enough courage to go up and say to him, you know, and, and of course, Louis being very droll and all, he says, oh yeah, well, uh, and uh, he mentioned the day and mentioned the time, and uh, it was in Cable Street in Dublin, and I went with, I, I actually didn't have my guitar with me, but I got a lot of guitar, an awful guitar, acoustic guitar, you know, 
And um, it was interesting where he, he was up in, in Nordial Keynes. Keen, so it was a, a hardware shop, if I remember correctly. And it was a stuff at the floor of a hardware shop. Obviously, he was renting it. And uh, there was a, a, nur, a nun beside me. So I wasn't sure if I was in the right place. And I remember saying to the nun, um, uh, is this Mr. Lewis Stewart teaching here? And she said, oh, yes, yes, yes. And I looked at her and I said, go on. I was thinking, this nun... I thought I was getting away from all that you know, <laughs> environment, seminary experience, and this nun sitting beside me. And she says, oh, he teaches everything. I said, okay. And then I said, I'd say it, and the next minute, she was learning a Bach piece. She was playing a, a fugue by Bach. And Louis Amazing. Was teacher, you know? <laughs> so when I went in, I was totally distraught of that. I didn't know what to do. So I just he said, uh, oh, yeah, you, yeah. I said, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I want to play like you. And he said, okay, well, play something and I of course play some jazz and I couldn't I, I couldn't play any jazz of course but I, I said I sang and played by the time I get to Phoenix you know and uh, I always remember he simply wrote out an arrangement of it for a guitar which started like this <laughs> I went crazy, you know. Um, so he knew the song, and because uh, I thought I was going to learn all the sort of popular monkey songs and all that, and you know, I thought he was going to do arrangements. But it was amazing his wealth of knowledge even then. He knew a lot of pop songs, and he just instantly uh, on the guitar did an arrangement, which I still have today. And would he would he write out like notation he, for he, you? He would just write out the chords and put yeah. the melody note like all his quarter notes, not not like straight. But you you know, you got the main idea. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. And how long did you go to him for lessons? I got, I got six altogether. Then he threw me out or said something. I hope you have something else to fall back on. He wasn't <laughs> too impressed at the time, you know. And so I ended up being a teacher, you know. <laughs> and uh, wait, so did you start being a teacher soon after that? Uh, I did go back because having a degree in, in theology and all that didn't allow myself to teach in a secondary school. And all. So I remember I did I did the hitch dip and things. And I studied English then, English literature. Yeah, I did that then after that. And meanwhile, I, I was I just playing a little bit around. I played, um, I got them to play with people like Brian Dunning. Um, and that was the, the 70s and around that. And they had a group called Jump. And it was kind of fusion music. And I, I got involved in that. Uh, Mike Nolan, that was very interesting. They were almost members of some sort of uh, show bands and the show bands were playing, but there was all, they were always free on a Monday. So they started a gig in Cable Street, and in the 70s, Cable uh, Slattery's, it was called Slattery's, and Slattery's was the biggest, I suppose, most popular place at the time. And Monday it was Jump, which I eventually got a gig with them. So upstairs Tuesday was the Rock Fox Big Band, and then on Wednesday they had Planksty, and then on Friday they had Louie, sometimes Louie with Noel Keelahan or Jim yeah. Doherty, so it was a place to be... They, it was, you know, amazing place to be seen at and also get to play because um, uh, you met a lot of people, a lot of musicians, and uh, uh, it was a terrible place from the point of view. Uh, you had to go down early, you wouldn't get a place. You could be sitting beside the toilets all night. <laughs> it wasn't a very attractive place, but so there was usually a queue to get in and uh, what Louie was playing, you know. But it was amazing that I could hear Plankstay. I used to go down here Plankstay and they were playing upstairs with... Uh, you know that great group at the time yeah. amazing amazing and, yeah but how did you get from like playing beatles songs to playing with jump like did you practice a lot during that time yeah that was that was that's good it's interesting yeah i think basically jump was a group that was playing kind of fusion music and uh, so you you had a because i was i did play some rock you know before that i mean i might have been sitting on like sitting in one chord like a, a modal thing you know yeah it was easy to play you know and they just say just you know they'd write out a chart and it would just be an e minor and uh e minor nine and stuff like that so it, I, I was getting into that i didn't take any solos at the time right. um uh, but i was practicing at home because louis left me some scale practices to do and i really practiced that and then the chords i was telling you maybe i, I, I was practicing these chords uh, on the acoustic guitar, it was acoustic guitar. I have. So I used to play the plectrum, the plectrum sort of all across the string. And so 
that sort of replace the finger style playing, you know? Right. Let's, uh, I want to ask you more about that later and we can like see what you're doing as well. But did you start playing more gigs then and how did it go when you were, were you teaching full time then and also gigging? So how did that work? Yeah, I was, I was teaching part time and I was doing this uh, degree with the HDF. Yeah, I, I was teaching in a convent actually, would you believe it? Crossing by some convent, you know? Wow. Um, I knew about the. I didn't know too much about the cross or the passion of the convent. All I knew was uh, the nuns fed me very well at lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> they were very good for that. You got a little glass of port to help you with your sec, you know, mid <laughs> classes in the afternoon. And generally, <laughs> teachers there, they used to fall asleep, half of them, you know. <laughs> but that, that, I did my dip at that uh, convent and uh, I got that. So, yeah. And, and after that, I, I was more or less trying to get a full-time job because I was married then and I had two kids, uh, Maud and Hugo. So I was just not leaving a lot of work because Annie, who was French, was working in the French school. Um, so um, I was looking for a job, basically. But I was still playing away part-time and hearing jazz. That's right. Um, and That was taken off. And by the time the 80s came, I had a full-time job teaching. And, and I suppose by then I was playing a little bit more. Um, practicing a little bit more. So I was, I was generally getting my chops together, you know, and, and playing uh, and, and also playing with different people was great. Uh, that was interesting in Dublin. Uh, I think at that time, just before the 80s, mind you, you were always compared to Louis Stewart because he was the, the role model for a lot of us, you know, including guitar players like younger than me, people like Dave O'Rourke, uh, people like that, you know. Uh, Hugh Buckley would have been much younger again, but uh, as you know, that Dave went to the States, uh, yeah, and uh, of course, yeah. but, uh, we were all sitting there, you know, under Louis' feet when he would play, you know, and some people would go home and smash the guitar up, uh, or at the end of the, <laughs> when he would go, because they said, that's it, that's not for me, or, but, um, and I sort of persevered, and I thought, you know, uh, you were learning everything that Louis was trying to play, or sorry, we were trying to play like Louis, sorry, and uh, learning from records. And, you know, we obviously knew he was influenced by people like Joe Pass, Wes Montgomery, so we were all, that was the jazz that we were learning at the time, you know. What about Pat Martino, was he? Yeah, he was an amazing Pat that... Martino fan, that's right. Louis was just, yeah, he just uh, talked about it all the time. And then when I heard Pat Martino, I was back to that idea. It was the right hand technique that Martino had picking every note. Yeah. And all doing those like. He had this amazing right hand technique, which I really took to because um, I'd been working on my right hand because um, all the guitar players you would see, uh, if they were acoustic players, they had the right hand technique. And I'm sure you would know more about it than myself, uh, Daniel. But um, I, 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 I didn't want to, uh, if you like, decide that um, I was trying to cover two, uh, the, the, the acoustic playing and the electric by trying to do both, you know, because mm. I love the sound of the acoustic, you know, it was something else. And even to this day, I, I still play, you know, so I made a record with Norma Winston, just acoustic guitar and her, uh, which I thought was really uh, interesting uh, from my point of view anyway. <laughs> but uh, yes, so the right hand technique was uh, for me, always been a springboard to really um, execute those kind of phrases, those long lines that people like Martino would play. You know, you, it, was a, it was a tall order at that time because uh, Louis would say, there's only one Pat Martino and, and you guys, you know, I hope you know, <laughs> some of you guys, yeah, sure. But uh, it, it was a great time for guitar players in Dublin in the early 80s, you know, because uh, you could see somebody of that caliber live without, well, before the old, uh, as you could imagine, before the the uh, jazz festivals came around, you know? Yeah. We were better off in piano players, if you like, and trumpet players and all that, because uh, I think most people would agree that Louis was our best prodigy of, of that, that music, which we now call jazz, yeah. And so what did you actually practice to develop the picking? You were talking about playing chords. It was just like playing jazz, you know, basically like triads, you know, up and down, right hand, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I'm playing a... Yeah. You're just playing like getting the, for the fifth string. Yeah, no thing like that. And then the sixth. Yeah, you know, I used to 
practice these six chords like. You should play with that. And then, um, for the individual strings, apart from these kind of chords, I used to practice what McLaughlin used to do on these kind of uh, very open, like um, uh, like an ASOS chord. I'd be good. And then I got some ideas, like you used to play triads like this. Which you play to repeat the note. Now but the CD does that a lot. He does like kind of right hand techniques I was doing but I was picking every note for, without playing legato uh, the legato thing I learned then from people like John Abercrombie that came later with uh, the opportunity to meet him yeah yeah and that sounded amazing yeah that was great what what kind of pick do you use I use a soft I use a medium pick and uh, Jim Lott Jim Dumlott Jim Dumlott sorry uh, yeah number three it's just a little bit hard, but it's, 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 you know, it's just in between a very soft and a very hard one. So I, I can get a little bit of response from acoustic guitar with it. I, yeah. I, I used to use a harder pick for the acoustic guitar, you know? Yeah. Um, but I, I've agreed that this one could work. Um, if you don't use a really heavy gauge strings, and you know, if you, if you use like an acoustic 12D, at the most maybe a 13 to get a little bit, um, uh, just that resonance on the acoustic guitar. Of course, on the electric, I use a 12 or 11. Yeah, yeah. So the pick really um, cuts across and cross sections over both for me, which I'm happy with, you know, rather than to change plectrum every time you play the acoustic, you know? Yeah. And um, yeah. Interesting, interesting stuff. Let me just yeah. tell everybody if you have a question at any point for Tommy, just you can either type it into the chat. Or you can, there's a Q&A box. There's like different places you can ask a question, but fire one in any time and we'll get Tommy to answer. So Tommy, you're going to play a tune called Step. Tell us about that tune. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is a very personal one, I, I suppose. Uh, because I wrote it for my granddaughter, who was quite young. Now she's eight years of age now, and and um, uh, I wrote it a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, yeah. And of course, when you when you say this is for, when you tell her, when I told her, sorry, when I told her this is for her, you know, of course, when you play it for her, she she says, oh God, you know, the reaction is like <laughs> somebody of that age would like to hear something very poppy or something that she could probably at least try and sing along with, you know, and. Um, However, at the same time, I, I felt that as she got older and uh, when I may, mightn't be around and all that, maybe it would stand to her as uh, some sort of a personal souvenir. Uh, and that's why I call it Step. And when I presented it to, um, for the record for Norma, Norma Winston, I couldn't believe it. Um, she arrived in the studio and she, and in the studio and she said, uh, Tommy, uh, do you remember that tune Step? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, we should do it. I said, well, um, uh, what about you singing it? And she said, don't worry, I've written words. <laughs> and she wrote wow. lyrics. And um, so which is, it's, it's out on the record I have, you know. And it's lovely because um, uh, the, the, the actual, uh, I suppose, sentiment of the words would be step, the young person moving into life, you know, taking different steps to find what real the life is all about. And she just copped that straight away, you know. So anyway, Amazing. I'll play a bit of it for you. Great. Go, okay. go for it. Go for it.
Yeah. Oh, I was muted. You couldn't hear me clapping. <laughs> so it's called Step for Lara on the album. That's right. And is that album available? Tell me, how can people get that? But I get up me, uh, uh, sometimes uh, you can get it in Jazz in the Terrace. Yeah. Jazz in the Terrace, um, Alan Smith has copies of it as well, yeah. Cool. Uh, but if they, call, if they email me, I can send it to anybody, yeah. Okay. And uh, John McGrath asks, what's your, what's your warm up routine? Do you have a warm up routine? Um, when you play. Yeah, I usually get up in the morning, you know, and I decided to, see, that's the first thing to do. <laughs> and I drink. Uh, um, you know, I think my uh, musical routine tends to be very much the same as a lot of people, you know. Um, uh, I, 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 I practice shapes and stretching a little bit because I think when you get older, um, you, um, like everybody else, uh, um, uh, we were talking about that to, to some other guitar players, you know, uh, do I still play the way 20 years ago or 30 years ago? Somebody asked Pat Martini the same question and he said no. He feels that he's not, he doesn't play the same way. He says the only guy that we see at the moment that can still play with the same energy, at the same the chops of somebody like John McLaughlin maybe, the guitar player John McLaughlin. Uh, my basic routine would be uh, stretching because as you get older, you know, I, I tend to do these kind of, yeah, stretching, you know, um, um, and then, um, I, yeah, and then I, I simply play a couple of tunes, you know, I might sort of go like, as a chord melody, my shining earth. just a simple um i play a song maybe and then i'll do the usual like what everybody does i probably try and think of is there anything new i can play um and i do a little bit of free playing i just take a note and take a note below or a note above and, and play around with it just uh, any choice of a note is good close my eyes and go for e maybe you know and if i go up would it be different if i went down for example and i i, I try to construct little melodic or little motifs And then I introduce, try to introduce some sort of counterpoint, like a, what Bach would do. Uh, or, or things like that, you know. Um, the thing is to try and get, um, I think the important thing is try to be musical in terms of, um, you know, uh, I, I, I think technique is a bad word. Uh, if it's not used properly. And I tend to think of ten technique as not just playing fast, but uh, really in control of the instrument, both in right hand, right hand and, and left hand, in terms of that, what you try to express musically comes off as opposed to playing really, you know, mm -hmm. that's what I mean that we did that when we were younger <laughs> and maybe now it's time to play music. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, There's a few questions came in. Uh, Ian asks, what is there, was John Wadham's influence on you in terms of time? Could you right. say anything about that? Yeah, well, the 80s, uh, I have to say, to be quite honest, and this is no offense to somebody like um, <clears throat> Louis Stewart or anything, when I got the trio with Ronan and uh, uh, John Wadham together, I have to say um, that Wadham was a major influence because uh, he really taught me how to play in time because his time feel was amazing. Um, and also, uh, John was very interesting because not only could he, he would point out that I played a wrong note on the bridge of a song, you know, that should be an E natural instead of an E, uh, an e flat or something. Uh, he knew the music back to front and also because he played the piano, played the double bass, he was very musical. And um, his sense of form, he taught me that. He said, you should always play to form, Tommy, which meant not just knowing 32 bars, but knowing that where when you play, everybody knows where you are. You're going to the bridge here, as opposed to playing the second time around on the, 
Yeah, so, and, and John would mark it out if he thought you were in difficulty. He was, he was very supportive in that way. So I have to say, not only did I learn to play a very good time feel, uh, but he taught me how to play, how to play them musically as well. So certainly a major influence in my life in the 80s, yes. Really interesting. I never knew that he also played piano and double bass. That's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, did he play with Louis as well in Louis's he group? Did, yeah, he made the first record with Louis, Louis the First, and that's, that's a famous version with all the things you are. Yeah, Thomas, you know, uh, which is amazing because uh, Louis, uh, Louis was the wad, and he would set it up for Louis, you know, because uh, John's time was so good. So Louis really plays well every time he played with the wad. I think anyway, great, yeah. Amazing. The first record I got of Louis was. Well, it was John Wadham and Friends, you know, that record. Yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. Well, that was Wadham's record. Yeah. And, and yeah, but even there's a kind of free part in that, which is really good. It's Spontaneous really good. composition, really good. That's right, that's right, yeah. And, and the foot, Louis, footprints on it is amazing. Yeah. And that's the same time as out in his own Louis record, where right. he that one where he played like all the standards and Blue Boss out, which is amazing. Of course, that's an amazing record. That is, yeah, yeah. Um. Emily O'Rourke is asking, when you're composing, do you prefer to write on the guitar and then transpose it to other instruments or notate it or work on just ideas and then put it onto the guitar? Yeah, I, that's a good question. Yeah, I suppose I, suppose, uh, I probably would, uh, I would have an idea. It could be in the middle of the night or something, you know, and you, if you were smart about it, you would still go down and write the three or four notes down and sometimes i've done that or, or at least would might if it's gone by morning then you know you, you you there's a little cautionary tale in there for you sometimes say well always get up and just write it it doesn't happen all the time it's not magical composition like that or it just comes in uh, in the middle of the night however i think most um, times uh, when i got an idea it was maybe hearing it and then trying it out to, to sort of see that the idea I had uh, was the same notes on the guitar, you know? Uh, you know the way you say, but I've got this idea, and then you go to guitar, oh God, it's not that at all. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, and then you, you you did have something else in your mind. So you experiment and you, you try it again, and eventually you come to some sort of an agreement. That was the notes you thought of, and then if you like them. For example, that one with uh, Step, it was just a... <laughs> I wanted to keep something simple. So, you know, something like that. Da, change the chords to repeat it. Because they like to hear things repeated. It goes all the way, you know. So um, in that way, it was four or five notes I thought of. And then uh, just a little bit of harmonic um, interest by changing it. Uh, that's, yeah. You're, you're approach to harmony i think is very unique and recognizable like when you're playing chords yes it sounds like you just when you're playing chords so yeah. like how how did you find your own for your own style of harmony how did you come up yeah. with it that's a good question i don't i never thought about that thing i mean that's very uh, i suppose I, in many ways I think by playing chord, when I went to Louis, I, I didn't really play a lot of solo work. You know, he taught me, he had this idea, take the melody as the top note of the chord. So, you know, like one note samba, you know. You know, um, you know. Yeah, there's things like that. I mean, the total strength of one note, you know, yeah and things like that you know he, he was i remember in one class he would say oh this is the note i want him and i'm stuck here but he would play one note and he could suggest you know and he go on this and all of a sudden i just realized yeah um the whole concept of reharmonization of a standard song you know uh you know like uh, I, I got into that and i realized those were amazing possibilities you know um of taking taking different song, songs uh, um, together, uh, standard like uh, like uh, autumn leaves, you know, you know. I used to do that, and I think basically uh, what gave me a strong harmonic sense was then 
I saw notes having number a different number of harmonic um, tonal strengths, and I worked from that. You know, every time I, you know, like if I got a note, is that is that big? You know, uh, you know, they're just playing around with it. You know. Um, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, just that idea. For example, uh, just an old standard, Paul. I tell you again, the a taste of honey. like a dominant and then yeah can you lift your fretboard any up of it can't see the fretboard yeah thank yeah. you now this note could be anything it's a g i could play g but i'm playing and then two chords together Say another an E open, I just play like and then D. So um, uh, there's an example. If, if you hear the original Taste of Honey, it has two chords. Yeah. But when you put it together, you work on the possibilities, even da, da, these notes offer you a number of different harmonic possibilities. So I, I got into that quite a bit, you know. And in terms of like any, is there any Irish influences on your playing from Irish music? Well, Irish, um, well, Irish music was interesting because we, we um, I, I started a group called, uh, good Lord, I forget the name. It was, um, uh, Martin Nolan, this is before another group we started with Ron called Kanda, which was an Indian group. No, yeah. there was another group before, uh, yeah, and there was a guy, um, um, that's right, uh, uh, Ronan, um, he played Tin Whistle, uh, I forget his second name, but I mean, he taught me how to play. And what was interesting, what we had in common, the six feel, you know, playing like uh, jigs and reels, you know, and um, he found that the jazz six, you know, uh, uh, it was very close to the uh, the Irish one. Uh, right. Because he heard me playing things like, uh, you know, like uh, the morning of the carnival, you know, that tune that's in the real book. Yeah. You know, uh, he might be going like, and he would go, he would stress the three pulse. One, two, three, one, two. You see, and I'd be playing six, so it's like one, two, three, and uh, he said, "Wow!" So we we put a group together, just doing this sort of thing. You know, it's a bit like that. Uh, you know that um, uh, Leonard Bernstein America. You know, it's like one, two, yeah, da 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 da. da. It's like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three. I want to be in America. Da 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 da. da. <laughs> See, all of a sudden you get six followed by a three. You know, da 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 do da 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 the trad world and yeah. also the jazz world. Yeah. We had a great night in the uh, the Bill Bucked. That was a club. It was, uh, was a bar actually, very famous. And, and that it's not doesn't exist anymore now. But um, yeah, you had those kind of people uh, because of Planksty. There you go. Was, yeah. and, I, and because I was listening to Planksty, I could hear with the guys. You could improvise with those kind of rhythms. Interesting. But then, yeah. And uh, actually, I'm going to just tell everyone I'm dropping. A link into the chat here it's a paypal link so if you have any tips for tommy or a couple of euros or anything or you don't have to but if if you do drop it to this paypal account and i'll pass it on to tommy it's my zoid account so just put a little note in there say for tommy so there's the link for that and uh, a great question in from my student con he said other than louis failure to appreciate your potential What's the greatest challenge you've had to overcome as a musician? Um, I suppose the, your, the criticism from your wife. Really? 
<laughs> when she tells you, no, I'm not going out to hear you. You've been playing the same lines for the last 25 years, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, um, which keeps you uh, pretty much on your toes because, you know, every time, if you see her sitting down there with that, uh, her, her face assuming a deep tropical burn, you know you're in trouble. You know? <laughs> It must have been um, hard though when you were like a full-time teacher and then to also play gigs like it's a very full schedule. Yeah, yeah it was very hard. I agree. Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. I think it's the trend. They, they almost said uh, Dr. Jekyll. No, I won't say that's not exactly that. Yeah. Um, change in personality. But certainly uh, as a performer and a teacher, there are two separate kind of identities. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, a, 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 a pedagogy um teaching is not the same as playing on stage where you're trying to perform the music you know so i had to make that kind i had to live with that quite a while and really how to adjust uh, that was very difficult yeah that's right. and good like, question yeah would you would you have one, I think probably one of them. would you would you have been gigging like every weekend or when you were there was a day I have to say the 90s was great time because I had an album called Into with Brian, uh, Mike Nielsen and yeah. we were touring that, you know, Into Mike Nielsen. We were doing some Beatles songs, I arranged some and he did his own and we wrote some original stuff and uh, it seemed to work two acoustic guitars and it really went well. We got a very good review of it. The album was called Into and yeah, it was it was reckoned to be one of the best. <laughs> anyway, I better not but, say that. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say it because uh, it's more objective, but uh, I... I uh, have that album and I went to one of your gigs when it was you and Mike playing a duo around the time the album came out. Right. I think it was, I can't remember where it was, but it was really was one of the best gigs that I remember going to. It was so, so amazing. It was just like the kind of communication level was just so instant and fast and just, it was two people talking to each other at breakneck speed. You could just Thank hear you. that. Yeah really amazing thank you and did that lead that lead on to other gigs yeah we we we, we that was the acoustic one and, and then i had the remember the keith copeland trio yeah a very much another great event of my life you know and we made three records for staple chase and uh, a great drummer his father was ray copeland who played with the uh, Pelonius monk played the trumpet and so keith uh, i met him at the queen's university we used to do a summer course and Jordanstown, yeah, and uh, another great influence in my life. And again, his time feel being a great black drummer uh, really reinforced my time feel again, and it was so good. And also, uh, Keith uh, introduced me to Theolonius Monk's music and uh, yeah, and uh, other, other kind of music that I wasn't listening to at all. And also introduced me to Benny Goldson, and we did a tour of Spain with Benny Goldson playing all his music. And that was a great experience for me, yeah. Right, yeah. Question then from Taylor, who's your favorite guitar player of all time? Wow. Who's my favorite of all time? Yeah, I, I, I suppose, I suppose that I'm very uh, old school in that. I mean, it, it, sometimes when I feel you, I always put on the incredible jazz guitar of Wes Montgomery. It just somehow, it's like a desert island disc for me, you know? Um, Every track is just amazing, and uh, and he's at the top of his form. As you know, he made some commercial records afterwards and all that. But this is the one that every song, um, it's it just has, and it has that sort of what I would call the the early early tension and energy that Coltrane uh, was you know uh, coming to when he got into his own group with uh, of course his great quartet, but. Uh, Wes had that then, you know, and the octaves making the guitar sound like a horn as well, and all that. I think uh, certainly, and if I look back at it now, has anybody reached that kind of? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure, but he certainly is one of my first three. Anyway, uh, I would say that Wes Montgomery, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, his octaves defy gravity. <laughs> yeah, let's face it, you know, I mean, anybody can play the octaves like that has to be on a, on a different planet from ours, you know? So certainly Wes is uh, beyond his octave of gravity and that's the one. And then the early acoustic playing of John McLaughlin, My Goals Beyond. When I heard those chords, uh, you know, you know, 
I just thought, you know, this is another world I have to investigate. And it's not so much, it's not so much, a, it's a, a fusion or anything. It's just the sound. It's just those kind of sounds of sus chords that the way McLaughlin played them. You know, and then, and then, yeah, you know, and then you play it off. And then that whole sense of uh, investigating. So he would be one of the, that period. He'd be my wonder, maybe maybe third or second. And but Crombie's in there, so I have about three major guys that have uh, stand out in my life. In oh, cool. Des Higgins just asked, "What living guitarists do you like to listen to now?" So you mentioned two. I like um, Kurt Rosenwinkel. I like yeah. Kurt Rosenwinkel. Julian Lag, great uh, natural guitar player. Julian Lag, who can play. You know, there's a record of him playing um, just friend, da, 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 like, a, and he sounds like ja and modern Django, right? But the lines and the control of the instrument, but he's very musical, and he's very young, you know. Yeah, those two. Yeah, um, Mark Ducre would be a very good guitar player, he's playing more open free stuff that I've experienced in France, because I have a French trio with two La Laverne brothers. So I, I I hear a good bit of uh, open free European jazz, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, Louis Clavis now, uh, people like that, and uh, Mark Ducre is, is 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 amazing. Yeah, so he would be one of my favorite as playing that kind of open music. There's another guy called David David Chevalier that Christoph works with, and another guy, yeah, amazing. Yeah, cool. Loads of loads of people to check out there. I'll write in some I remember Mark Ducre, and uh, Ian Ian said, "Tell me." He's won't too old to do the money thing on the internet. He'll happily buy a bottle of good wine next time you meet Ian. I'm not sure which Ian that is, but here's some some of the people Tommy was talking about. There was uh, Mark Ducre and Kurt Rosenwinkel. He's great. How how did it come about that you played with Stefan Grappelli? Well, that just uh, that was uh, not yeah. I just. Uh... Uh, uh, there was people like uh, John Etheridge, you know, I played with John Etheridge in Cork. Uh, I don't know if the people might know that name. Uh, and um, uh, it was really, to be fair now, it was just a jam session. It was just a jam session. Marcel Solal, I played with in Cork, a French piano player, and we just got together, yeah. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't, I know people said, you, you know, yeah, but I say yes, but I didn't tour with them like when I talk about when you play with people, you generally say you did a tour, made a record, and things like that. So, with Steph and I, no, I wouldn't be my first number one, no. But sure. I, I know his music. And uh, recently, a great guitar player just passed away, used to work with him quite a lot, Mark, uh, Mark Fusse, F U S S E T. He just passed away. Uh, so, I, I got to know those kind of guitar players in France, and you know, and uh, uh, and in the style of Django, there's a there's two Elias brothers, there's two brothers Elias uh, uh, that play, and I played with them, so they were telling me all, and then Stefan was there, well, you know, and so it was like uh, there's a famous, <laughs> it's an unusual, there's a famous club in Paris called La Fontaine, and um, it's uh, where they play all the Manouche music, you know, and uh, and that's where they all hang out, so you get to know them, and I, I you know, that's that's what I was doing. Because it's still very strong that kind of gypsy style music in Paris and in in in, in, England, in France, sorry, you know. Yeah. And I, when I was teaching in France, I, I would have some students who are really into all, you know, playing that kind of stuff. Yeah, and they do, of course, very well. <laughs> How long did you live in France for? Yeah, I do. Go, I work good a bit in France. Yeah, and I brought just before the COVID hit there. I had two French guys over, a great bass player, Sebastian Boisseau, and then Christophe LaBaron. He's a drummer. I work with them regularly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do work a good bit. Yeah. <laughs> in France, yeah. What about the South American influence? You play quite a quite a lot of South American music as well. Oh, well, yeah. Well, uh, the, the residency that I'm doing in Don Leary at the moment, uh, Daniel, um, they asked me to do something. Uh, uh, jazz, but the uh, jazz as a hybrid form of music, and hybrid form it just means taking music from others, you know, like ethnic form of music. So I went to, I went, I just took Brazil because I I'm, would be quite close 
to understand what's happening there. And I'm back to the old thing that I feel that I would least uh, studied with. Their sense of harmony is very close to what I could deal with, as opposed to maybe other like Cuban music, maybe things like that. So I just identified more with the Brazilian music. So um, for the the um, the residency down, I, I I composed four or five in the style of um, uh, of Brazil. I did it like a I did it like a bio rhythm. You're right, you know, but the harmony was more like Lydian and things like that, which would be more jazz uh, harmony as opposed to their kind of uh, more straightforward, like uh, uh, maybe minor diminutions, uh, those kind of scales. Yeah. So I, I try to see if I could get a melange of the two that would be like jazz harmony with the, the obviously the Brazilian rhythms. Cool. And like, did you? How, was it Ronan who introduced you to Brazilian music first? Or? Yeah, yeah, we were yeah. all we were all interested in it, you know. Yeah. Um, and this is uh, here's an example of which I always try to do. You know this kind. <laughs> this is a kind of um, partito alto rhythm, you know, and uh, just getting things. And of course, the problem is they played with their fingers, as you know. <laughs> yeah. So I did try and get this on. So it stood to me the the my practicing the individual strings on the right hand kind of kind of uh, made it sound not obviously as authentic as the Brazilian guys, but at least authentic as anybody playing who are non-Brazilians their music. You know, we get close to what they, you know. Yeah, yeah. We're getting pretty close to the hour when we're going to finish up one more question in and then you're going to play a tune by Brazilian composer Hermé de Pascal. Yeah. So. Yes. Um, yeah. Just before you play it though. You want to be. Yeah. He's, yeah before, uh, go ahead. Say something about Hermé Right. Yeah. Well, just he was a, he was a blind, he's an Arbino, uh, Arbino composer, you know, uh, unbelievable, lived up on up on the north of Brazil and uh, one of these just talking all the instruments and writing music that nobody can play properly <laughs> except his group, El Grupo, you know. This one is a, it's just basically a, a song based on a, a pedal uh, which, which I like and, and the great thing about uh, biorhythm they use a lot of repeated notes, which you're going to hear now if I can play them right, you know. Uh, this is called um, Leo Nam Stante Instante, and uh, Leo is just a name, uh, and uh, it means now and in an instant, off we go. So this is a, a tune by Hermeto Pasquale. Yeah, I can play it right. <laughs>
like that. <laughs> yeah. Great, great stuff. Thanks so much, Tommy, for joining me. And it's been really, 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 really interesting and great to hear you play. Thank Just you. Thanks very much for having loads me, of, Daniel. Loads, loads of comments loads coming in here, saying yeah. thank you and brilliant. And uh, is there is there anything coming up with the residency? Is there going to be any kind of? Yeah, well, just uh, there's a twenty, the twenty, uh, the twenty seventh of uh, the IMC are putting on um, uh, icons of jazz, and I'm doing, I'm playing a uh, John Schofield's music. If anybody's interested in that, you know, and um, it's a Saturday, the twenty, is that right? Twenty seventh, yeah. So it's uh, yeah, twenty seventh, and then that's been uh, live stream live. Yeah, or live stream, whatever they say now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's IMC, yeah. And then the residency is a later, that'll be later on. I'll talk about, well, I'll, you're probably here. Okay. Yeah. Cool, okay, cool, great stuff. And uh, if anybody here is interested in a live stream guitar course, we have one coming up. It's the blues course starting next week, four week course. You guys can, I'll put the, link in there if you want to check that out and we have a 20 euro voucher code off that tommy all lowercase that's our code for getting a voucher for the course so i'll put that in here as well voucher code is tommy all lowercase and uh anything else coming up or what if tommy if somebody wanted to contact you you said for the cd or yeah your, your email all one word, yeah, at gmail.com. Tommy Hefferty at gmail.com. Send Tommy an email if you want to get a CD or a lesson with you. Do yep. you do lessons yeah, with yeah. people? Okay. Say contact you, yeah. So contact Tommy if you want a CD or a lesson. Click our link if you want it. Four week blues course, one hour a week. And uh, that's it for Guitar Night Live. We'll probably be back. We won't be back next month. We're not taking December off. So January, we're probably going to have Mike Nielsen. Oh, great. You should come along too. Yeah. We're going to, Mike has to get yeah. wired up with the internet first. So January, we're going to get Mike on. Thanks everyone. Good night. And we'll uh, see you soon, Tommy. Thanks Thank again. Thanks, great talking to you. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye everyone. Bye-bye. Good you. night.